Okay, so I'm the last one. Thank you for coming back. I was wondering, actually. And uh, thank you to Julia and uh, for inviting me and the rest of the Kyochu team for making this possible, also to Iktus Kask and everybody else. Um, yeah, um, my name is Jaume Ferrete Vázquez and I work as an artist with the subject of uh, voice and listening. I work with uh, performance, sound works, workshops, websites, concerts, and um, talks also. And um, yes, this is a sort of uh, work in progress first version of a text around uh, on the subject of a synthetic speech or uh, synthetic voices, as uh, Kiera just mentioned. So let's go. So Helen Harper. Helen Harper, a telephone operator, one of those telephone operators who will connect, disconnect, and reconnect cables all across switchboards at the telephone exchange, the old telephone exchanges. So Helen Harper, whose work position required an involved body of a certain height, but still this did not stop people from referring to telephone operators as disembodied voices. So Helen Harper, a telephone operator, sits behind the console that serves to operate the boder or a voice operator demonstrator, the first electronic voice synthesizer ever built. She lays each of her fingers in each of the 10 keys of the boder's keyboard, her wrist on the wrist bar, her right foot on top of the pitch pedal, just as in the diagrams. Helen Harper looks at the audience of the 1940s New York World's Fair and waits for the presenter's instructions. Uh, the presenter then, speaking on the microphone, tells her, say, she saw me with no expression. Having been training for this during more than a year, Harper skillfully manipulates the controls and we hear the bother's male voice buzzing. She saw me. Now the presenter continues, say it in answer to these questions. Who saw you? She saw me. Who did she see? She saw me. Did she see you or hear you? She saw me. How was it? My impression of the bother's impression of the human voice, or my rendition, or my uh, repetition, my repetition of the bother's repetition of uh, the presenter's words, its training routines, a male English voice. It is not entirely clear who is speaking, other than Helen Harper herself. <coughs> the bother worked by filtering, filtering two sound sources, one that produced a noise and represented breath, the other an oscillator that represented the vibration of the vocal cords. There were no phonograph records or anything of that sort. In contemporary speech synthesis, a commonly used technique is based on the concatenation of sounds extracted from recordings of a human voice. A person is first uh, recorded reading a large number of meaningful or sometimes meaningless words and sentences that together contain all the sounds that can be heard in a particular language. And these sounds are later concatenated and modulated by the speech synthesis engine in execution time to, pro to produce uh, a speaking voice. Huh? <coughs> it seems to me that uh, concatenative synthetic voices expose a tension between singular and collective production of voice. On the one hand, each utterance of the synthetic voice in sounding cites, uh, quotes, the singularity of its source, not just any singularity, but the singularity of an embodied voice, always one's own voice. On the other hand, 
We do recognize synthetic voices as artifacts that are produced by collective effort, and that to be able to speak need to be activated by a user or an indeterminate number of users. In this sense, a concatenative synthetic voice can only happen as an object of not one, but many. But it is still founded on a singular embodied source, a voice, a voice whose singularity is brought back into sound in each and every utterance. Another implication of concatenative synthesis is a repetition. As long as you provide the, the same text input, you will obtain the same voice output. To me, this is perhaps the founding element of these uh, synthetic voices aesthetics, repetition. Repetition, not only in each instance of synthetic voice in relation to the previous or the next instance, but also in the synthetic voice as a whole in relation to its source. As long as you provide the same text input, you will obtain the same voice output. And even if we introduce a degree of uh, variability, the output voice will still be constrained by the limits established at the source. Each instance of synthetic voice brings back its source voice into sound. Again. In 2013, the daughter of the renowned physicist Stephen Hawking meets the daughter of the renowned voice synthesis engineer Dennis Klatt. In the 80s, Dennis Klatt used recordings of his own voice to develop the voice that, that Stephen Hawking uses. The name of that voice is Perfect Paul. So the daughter of Stephen Hawking meets the daughter of Dennis Klatt and tells her, Laura, I have to tell you something. Perfect Paul sounds just like my dad. Is Perfect Paul based on your father's voice? And she answers, yes. Which uh, therefore means that uh, my father is actually speaking with your father's voice. My father is speaking with your father's voice. And she says, yes, he will be 
so, so thrilled. It's been such an amazing experience for me to talk to you about how your father's life has been transformed by my father's research. And I had never really thought before that my, father, my father's voice lives on. Your father is actually speaking with my father's voice. Your father is speaking with my father's voice. Your father is speaking with my father's voice. My father, my father, my father's life, my father's life. Your father's research, your father's research. How my father's life has been transformed by your father's research. My father is speaking with your father's voice. 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 Thirty-five. Several of the deck talk voices. I am perfect Paul, the standard male voice. I am beautiful Betty, the standard female voice. Some people think I sound a bit like a man. I am huge Terry, a very large person with a deep voice. I can serve as an authority figure. My name is Chet the Kid, and I am about 10 years old. Do I sound like a boy or a girl? I am Whispering Wendy, and have a very breathy voice quality. Can you understand me even though I am whispering? I am Jaume Ferrete Vázquez, and I have a very breathy voice quality. Can you understand me even though I'm whispering? Again, the birds can sleep on the smooth planks. Four hours of steady work faced us. A wisp of cloud hung in the blue air. The bark of the pine tree was shiny and dark. The pennant waved when the wind blew. We find joy in the simplest things. Can you understand me even though I'm whispering? The pennant wave when the wind blew. The box was thrown beside the park track. Glue the sheet to the dark blue background. If you mumble, your speech will be lost. So, Anna Case. Anna Case, American soprano. <coughs> enters a record store in Iowa, hears a record of her own voice playing, and starts singing along with it. She says, when I walked in the door, I started singing with the record and making my voice sound exactly like it. A few years later, Thomas Alva Edison will turn this idea into what he called the tone tests. The tone tests were concerts in which singers will sing along recordings of their own voice playing on Edison's phonograph on stage. The purpose of the tone tests was to demonstrate that the phonograph was able to reproduce sound voice with such fidelity that production and reproduction became indistinguishable from each other. The audience was convinced. At the show's climax, the lights went off, and none of them could tell the difference between live and recorded voice. They became indistinguishable from each other. So the quality of being the original voice was lost, or at least became inaudible. The only thing the audience could hear were repetitions of repetitions, or echoes of echoes of echoes, or representations of representations, and so on. The pennant wave when the wind blew. The box was thrown beside the park truck. Blew the sheet to the dark blue background. If you mumble, your speech will be lost. Again. If you mumble, your speech will be lost. Fine soap saves tender skin. Keep the hatch tight and the watch constant. These sentences I've been repeating are called the Harvard sentences. You may know them, perhaps. 
They are uh, 720 phonetically balanced sentences where phonemes appear at the same frequency that they appear in the English language. They were created during World War, World War II in a secret war laboratory in Harvard, and since then have been used extensively to test the intelligibility of speech in, for example, radio communication, telephonic communication, and of course in speech synthesis. So they were used to test the intelligibility of synthetic voices. These days, a jam like is a rare dish. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. Four hours of steady work faced us. These days, a chicken leg is a rare dish. These days, a jam like is a rare dish. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. Four hours of steady work faced us. Four hours of steady work faced us. The birch panel slid on the smooth planks. We loom the sheet to the dark blue back around. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. These days a chicken leg is a rare dish. The birch canoe slid on the loose planks. The birch panel slid on the smooth planks. Glue the sheets to the dark blue background. We loom the sheet to the dark blue back around. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. These days a chicken leg is a rare dish. I find the collateral aesthetics of the Harvard sentences very interesting. We can look at, at them as uh, scripts or scores, scores for uh, speech, listening explicitly, and an indeterminate communication technology that may affect the relation between voice and listening. We can also look at them as promises. Each Harvard sentence is a promise that an act of speech and listening will happen through the mediation of some technology. To add to the feeling these sentences give, there is the fact that the content of the sentences is completely unrelated to all of this, no? and completely unrelated as well to the context of war in which they were written and the needs of war communication, which is why they were written. Again. Again. Fine soap saves tender skin. Fine soap saves tender skin. Keep the hatch tight and the watch constant. Keep the hatch tight and the watch constant. Every word and phrase he speaks is true. Every word and phrase he speaks is true. The Harvard sentences sound very similar to the sentences that are used to produce synthetic voices. For example, in concatenative synthesis. Again, in concatenative speech synthesis, a person is recorded reading a large number of sentences that together contain all the sounds that can be heard in a particular language. So the first thing that the producers of the synthetic voice, Amazon, Microsoft, will do is selecting a language. And once the language has been selected, the sonic possibilities and limitations of the synthetic voice will be already established. The voice will sound as how Amazon, Microsoft imagine that a normative version of the selected language uses to sound, and nothing more. Any voice manifestation that exceeds the spoken language will need to be specifically recorded and added to the voice as a sort of an extra. Laughing, breath, the sound of the moving mouth. It seems to me that, in general, synthetic voices gravitate towards imagined normative versions of spoken languages and away from anything bodily. You know? and so anything uncertain, unstable, and possibly excessive. Very recently, researchers at Google presented a rather new and very different approach 
for synthesizing human voice. Perhaps some of you already know about it. Their approach is titled WaveNet and is based on machine learning or deep learning techniques. Instead of uh, filtering a sound source to produce voice such as Helen Harper did with the boulder, and instead of uh, recombining fragments of a previously recorded voice such as in concatenative synthesis, what Google does is training a machine by feeding it large databases of recordings of human voices. The machine looks at the sound waves that these voices produce when digitized, no? and then attempts to produce its own sound waves sam sample by sample. <coughs> sound waves that look like the sound waves in which it has been trained. And consequently, producing voices that should sound like the voices in which it has been trained. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Aspects of the Sublime in English Poetry and Painting, 1770 to 1850. These are examples of that technique. Interestingly enough, to reproduce speech with this technique, researchers have to additionally transform the text they want to synthesize into linguistic and phonetic features and then feed it to the machine. So if the machine is asked to produce speech without feeding it this language-related information, it just repeats after the voices it has been listening to, disregarding language. Sådan. Ved du, hvad jeg tror, jeg er jo stille med Zermann, og den er blevet til noget. Jeg sidder sammen til, jeg er den her fredning, der går kønne lige i skov. Jeg er blevet til os. Så det er bare ikke tydeligt. Så vi tager sådan den. Hitter som. Fun, det er nok godt. Drop for ikke, så igen det vand. Det er også en sådan en dag. Hvad er det i dag? Jeg prøver at tage det, fordi det kommer. Så det er sådan langvejsløs og speechlike synthetic voices. And we can hear uh, bodily sounds actually in them. No? We can hear the, the breath and the moving mouth when they speak. I think the second one is the most clear in that. So they just tie pictures and tell. So it's a certain. It's a song. When I heard them, I thought that, of course, once the production process of, of these synthetic voices has been freed from uh, normative language as a structure in principle, as a structure in principle, the synthetic voices mirror or organic voices, in mirroring or organic voices, reminds us that voices and has always been bodily, no? In this, in uh, showing us or reminding us that the, the voice has always been bodily, they bring me back again to the voter and the moving bodies of the telephone operators articulating its buzzing voice. The machine uses only two sounds produced electrically. One of these represents the breath. The other, the vibration of the vocal cords. There are no phonograph records or anything of that sort. Only electrical circuits, such as are used in telephone practice. Let's see how you put expression into a sentence. Say she saw me with no expression. She saw me. Now say it in answer to these questions. Who saw you? She saw me. Whom did she see? She saw me. Did she see you or hear you? She saw me. Thank you. That's all.